So hello and welcome to this SHRA Masterclass on Compliant Pre-Bid Collaboration and Procurement. Um, I'm sure those are lots of words that you've come across before and sort of reflect some of the concerns that you already have um, about how to procure um, for the Housing Retrofit Programme. Um, in terms of what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to give you a brief introduction as to um, who I am and what I'm doing here. Um, we're going to look at what the problem is in terms of balancing the tight time scales you have for procurement processes, but also for the bidding um, and the actual delivery of the retrofit works um, and the desire to collaborate with the supply chain against the need for compliant procurement processes. I'm going to look at some of the constraints of the public contracts regulations um, 2015 um, and hopefully alongside that some opportunities that the regulations offer us. I'm going to look at some of the options that you have um, for pre-market engagement in a compliant way and looking at some different procurement routes that might be helpful. And then if you're in the live session of this, there'll be an opportunity for discussion and questions at the end. So we'll start with the Scylla Black line of hello, who are you and where do you come from? Um, I'm Gail Monk. I'm a senior, senior associate at Anthony Collins um, Solicitors. We're a firm based in Birmingham and Manchester. Um, my particular specialism is in public procurement and all things to do with public contracts. Um, I have a particular focus on achieving social and environmental value through those contracts. Um, and in the context of decarbonisation works, um, I also look at the funding arrangements behind them and subsidy control issues alongside the procurement and contracting questions that come up. Um, so yes, that's me. So moving on then, in terms of what the problem is starting off, the main problem is, is there enough time to follow the rules? Um, so let's face it, let's be honest, the timescales for submitting your bid for the SHDF funding, for finding a contractor to do the works, and then for actually completing the retrofit works, all of those timescales are incredibly tight. And so the expectation on you as bidding entities is that you will have a supply chain in place or at least set in motion by the time you're even allocated the funding. At the same time, the supply chain is under pressure to deliver in a way that they've not previously been geared up to achieve. And so there's real benefit to engaging with the supply chain as early as possible to prepare them for the opportunities because they might be in a position where they're needing to scale up their operations, they may need, may need to be, be, be upskilling their, their workforces to enable them to deliver these works. Um, so the inevitable pressure then is that procurement is both time consuming and costly and tenderers will want some assurances that they're not bidding for a pipe dream but for a fully funded project and so while you don't want to leave procurement until funding is secured neither can you guarantee funding to tenderers if you procure early nor can you justify the cost of procurement in advance if you're not then allocated the funding under the program and so there it is, the first problem. Time is short, but you still need to follow the procurement rules without that process eating into your timeline for delivery too far and without making retrofit within the timescales for the funding completely unachievable. And then how do you do that? How do you achieve that while also engaging with the supply chain as early as you possibly can? So if we look then at some of the constraints of the Public Contracts Regulations 2015, the main point, of course, is that contracts over specified financial thresholds must be procured following the rules set out in the Public Contracts Regulations 2015. And even where those contracts fall below the financial thresholds within those regulations, they're likely to be the subject of your internal procurement rules or contract standing orders, and those rules are likely to require some form of competitive tendering exercise before you enter into a contract. In brief, what this means is that you must follow a compliant tendering process when choosing who to contract with for the retrofit works that are being funded under the programme, or to find another compliant way of choosing who to contract with, like using an existing framework that you or somebody else has procured. But the problem isn't really the procurement rules themselves, but rather how you engage with the marketplace as soon as possible without jeopardising that procurement process from the outset. The real challenge that's presented by the con public contracts regulations 
is how to ensure that your tender is a competing on a level playing field, especially when you've engaged with the marketplace before you go out to tender. So how can you ensure that you award the contract to the most economically advantageous tenderer, as is required under the regulations, based on an evaluation of their price and quality submissions on an objective basis, when you may have been talking to some of those tenderers before you start the procurement process? So the reality is that the regulations present the opportunities and try to answer some of these questions that we're asking. And the key regulations that you might want to look at um, are those that contemplate pre-market engagement, particularly Regulation 40, which relates to preliminary market consultations, and Regulation 41, which relates to the prior involvement of candidates or tenderers in a procurement process, their prior involvement with the contracting authority. So I'm going to look at those two in a little bit more detail so that we understand the constraints that there are within the regulations, but also the opportunities that are presented. Regulation 40 specifically allows preliminary, to, preliminary market consultations. Um, and that's really the first thing that I would stress in this context is that the public contracts regulations actively encourage engagement with the marketplace before you go out to market. And really the point about this is that once you're in a procurement process, you are constrained by the public contracts regulations and all of the rules that they contain. You're constrained by the by the rules about the way that you engage with tenderers, by the need to ensure that you provide the same information to each tenderer, the timescales involved and the detail of the rules and the procedure that you choose to follow. Before you go into that process, before you even think about issuing a contract notice, you have a huge amount more flexibility to engage with the marketplace in a way that can be without prejudice and without really prejudging the outcome of those conversations. What Regulation 40 says is that before you start a procurement procedure, you as the contracting authority may conduct market consultations with a view to preparing the procurement and informing economic operators, so those are your tenderers, of your procurement plans and your requirements. For this purpose, contracting authorities can, for example, seek or accept advice from independent experts or authorities or from market participants, so those potential tenderers themselves. That advice that you obtain can be used in the planning and conduct of the procurement procedure itself, provided that it doesn't have the effect of distorting competition and doesn't result in a violation of the core principles of non-discrimination and transparency. So what does that mean? What that means, what Regulation 40 confirms, is that you can engage with the marketplace before you procure, whether it's to inform the marketplace of your, in, your intentions, the likes of the meet the buyer days that you'll all be familiar with, to shape the procurement itself and the specification for your contract, to think about how you procure and what you're procuring, and to take specific advice from independent experts or from market participants, to genuinely take their advice about what you're procuring and how you procure it. To ensure that you are open and don't discriminate in the way that you engage with the marketplace, you need to think about how you're communicating with them. So here you could, for example, issue a PIN, apologies for the slide, a prior information notice to advertise the opportunity to engage before the procurement process starts. That means that what you're doing is you're creating an open conversation. You're not picking and choosing who you who you discuss the matter with, but you're giving everybody who is in the potential marketplace the opportunity to discuss with you. And the other thing that's really important about Regulation 40 is that it says that you can then use what you find from that consultation in the procurement exercise that you then undertake. That's provided that you don't distort competition. So provided that you can create a level playing field for the procurement and be confident that you won't discriminate in the decisions that you make in that procurement process. So in terms of how you do that, we're then going to have a look at Regulation 41. Now, Regulation 41 addresses the question of what you do if a candidate or tenderer in a, in a procurement exercise has had a prior involvement with you as the contracting authority before you started the procurement exercise. So whether or not that's because of a formal consultation exercise, um, so in the context of Regulation 40, or whether you just happen to have previous involvement with that potential tenderer. That might be a previous contract with them or another form of ongoing relationship. 
Um, and Regulation 41 really thinks about the worst case scenario um, and trying to avoid it arising. Regulation 41 says that where a tenderer has advised a contracting authority, so you've provi they've provided advice in the context of Regulation 41, 40 or otherwise, um, or has otherwise been involved in the preparation of the procurement procedure, um, you as the contracting authority are expected to take appropriate measures to ensure that competition is not distorted by that tenderer's participation or involvement in the, with you before. So the expectation is that where you've got a tenderer or a potential tenderer who has been involved with you in the past, they've got a bit of foresight about what's going on and they may even have helped shape your thinking about what you're procuring. You need to think about the measures that you need to take to ensure that you recreate a level playing field for that procurement exercise. Regulation 41 suggests that those measures should include communicating to the other tenderers and candidates any relevant information which has been exchanged in the context of that pre-market engagement um, or resulting from it. So any information that's been generated because of your discussions with tenderers before the procurement exercise, making sure that you're sharing that with all the tenderers. And that might be to do with the scope of the contract itself, the specification and the timescales, or it may be to do with the method of procurement that you choose to undertake. The other thing that Regulation 41 specifically suggests that contracting authorities do is consider fixing adequate time limits for the receipt of tenderers, bearing in mind that some tenderers may be privy to information that others have not. The best thing you can do to level the playing field is to give extra time wherever possible to enable them to get back up to speed, as it were. And the worst case scenario that I mentioned in Regulation 41 is contemplating situations in which you might need to exclude a tenderer from a procurement process because there's no other way in which you can find a solution to the question of their prior involvement. And what Regulation 41 says is that the tenderer or candidate can, should only be excluded from the procedure where there are no other means to ensure that you comply with your duty to treat tenderers equally. So this is your worst case scenario. As a worst case scenario, what you can do is you can look at the tenderers and go, OK, well, I have to exclude you because there is no way that I can get you as a tenderer onto a level footing with the other tenderers in this exercise. That's a worst case scenario for you as the contracting authority because you've invested time in the relationship that you've built with a, a potential tenderer, um, a, somebody in the supply chain. And obviously it's the worst case scenario for the tenderer themselves because they lose out on the opportunity to bid for your work. Um, so because it really is the worst case scenario, if you're in that situation, that tenderer must be given the opportunity to prove that their involvement in the procurement process will not distort the competition. So there's a bit of give and take there between you as the contracting authority and the supply chain that you've engaged with to argue that you can demonstrate a level playing field in the procurement process. So this gives you some guidance about how you can manage the consultation and engagement that you undertake with tenderers, with potential tenderers before you go through the procurement process in a way that doesn't jeopardise that procurement process itself. The key things to remember is that you can seek to level the playing field at the start of the procurement process by ensuring that you provide information to tenderers and by allowing additional time so that anybody who needs to play catch up can do so. Now, clearly, the key question that will be in people's minds when it comes to sharing that information is whether or not you've got any intellectual property or confidentiality issues concerned. So again, it is worth looking at the scope of that engagement that you undertake before the procurement exercise to make sure that you are open and transparent with tenderers. And part of that will be around ensuring that you are clear with the tenderers that you engage with prior to the procurement process, that any information gathered as a result of that will be made public knowledge. That will skew the conversations, it will make them different in the sense that there will be information about prices and timescales that tenderers aren't willing to share with you. 
but it's vital to ensure that you don't jeopardise that procurement process and that the information you gather is something that you can share with the other tenderers to make sure that it um, you get back to that level playing field. So then looking at that, what choices do you have? Um, the point of today's session is to look at how you balance out the needs for a compliant procurement exercise with the desire to collaborate with tenderers with the potential supply chain and to engage with them before you start to procure. So the first thing to look at is looking at pre-market consultation. And as I've described, there are different reasons why you, why you might want to do this. It might be to work out what the market can deliver, um, to help you understand what's achievable. So what's going to stretch this, the marketplace without breaking it? What's, what's achievable, what's ambitious, but not unobtainable? Um, it might be so that you can help identify the costs that are likely to apply to the works that you're, you're procuring and the details of the specification that you put together. Again, to allow you to fine tune what you procure to make sure it's achievable, stretching but attainable. Um, it alerts the marketplace to the upcoming procurement process and make sure that you get the interest that you need prior to actually going out to tender. Um, and it can allow you some without prejudice conversations with possible suppliers and contractors so that you're you're making sure you're having those commercial conversations as early as possible. As I've said, it's vital that you ensure those conversations are open and non-discriminatory, especially if they end up shaping what you choose to procure. Um, so the next thing to consider, therefore, is how you make those conversations open, transparent, non-discriminatory. And I've mentioned PINs already. These are prior information notices, which you can use in a couple of different ways. You can use them either to make your attentions for a planned procurement known, so you're alerting the marketplace to the future possible opportunity, or you can then use them as an, a call for competition in their own right. Um, if you do that, there's a couple of things to bear in mind. The first is that if you use a prior information notice as your call for competition rather than a more traditional contract notice, you're then limited to using either the restricted procedure or the competitive procedure with negotiation. So that's not an appropriate route if you want to use competitive dialogue, for example, or likewise the open procedure in the other direction. So think about those the, the tussle between the different priorities and, and needs that you need to think about. Um, if you do use a PIN as a call for competition in its own right, it has the benefit of shortening the timescales for the procurement exercise. So this is where I think the two come together really quite neatly, that you're looking at pre-market consultation, engaging with the marketplace before you procure, but doing so within the context of having issued a prior information notice so that when it comes to actually put something out to tender, you've got a good strong argument for shortening the timescales for that procurement exercise. That does need to be balanced out about against what I've said in the context of Regulation 41 and needing to allow appropriate timescales for the receipt of tenders to allow anybody who hasn't engaged in the pre-market engagement exercise um, the time to get back up to speed and really respond to that tender opportunity appropriately. If you've done your pre-market consultation successfully and comprehensively, though, you'll end up in a position where actually you can feel confident shortening the timescales for tender returns because the hard work's already been done. So those are two key things to think about in terms of how you engage with pre-market consultation. Think about what you're actually trying to achieve out of it, what the conversations are that you're, you're trying to, to have with the marketplace before you procure. And then think about it as a tool in the context of the procurement itself, because it will inform that procurement, but also potentially shorten that procurement. Then looking at some other things you might want to think about, um, the next question to ask is what choices do you have outside of that pre-market engagement, which might help you have a compliant procurement exercise without necessarily looking at the length of time that you need for a detailed negotiated exercise of one form or another under the regulations. Now, the most obvious thing to say here is that you've got two opportunities um, to procure very swiftly 
um, in the sense that there are framework agreements and dynamic purchasing systems out there already that you might be able to use. In both cases, these might be ones that you have set up that will work for what you're needing to procure now, or they might be things that somebody else has set up that you are entitled to use. I would give some cautionary advice in the context of either um, and say when it comes to looking to use a framework agreement or a DPS that somebody else has set up, do ensure that you're entitled to use them, that you've been named in the procurement process, either individually as an organisation or by reference to a class of con contracting authorities, and do satisfy yourself that they've been compliantly procured. When you call off from the framework agreement, when you use the dynamic purchasing system, the risk will be yours if there is any breach of the procurement rules. So do satisfy yourself that whichever system you're using that somebody else has procured on your behalf, that you're happy that it's been procured in a compliant way and you're not creating a risk of legal challenge. The other thing on a more commercial level to make sure of when it comes to framework agreements and dynamic purchasing systems is to ensure that they offer what you need without any compromise that you're unwilling to make. There will always be a compromise when you use a framework agreement because it's been procured with somebody else's specification in mind. So have a think about where the compromise is that you're happy to make and what compromise is unacceptable to you. Because whatever time benefit there might be to using a framework agreement, that's certainly outweighed if you end up buying something that isn't fit for purpose. The other thing to think about in terms of making the procurement process efficient, less time consuming and less costly is thinking about collaborative procurement. So that could be with a bidding consortia, the, a, gr a group approach to bidding for this funding and then thinking about procuring collectively for the works that you're bidding for, or it could be collaborating with your geographical neighbours or any other form of collaboration. Now, a collaborative procurement doesn't shorten the procurement process, but what it can offer is economies of scale and a more joined up approach to how works are undertaken within a region or within a consortia. Do be aware, though, of two things. One is that if you're procuring as a consortium, you need to be confident that all the parties in that consortium have needs and desires and ambitions that align with each other, that you're not pulling contractors in different directions. It's like with the framework agreements, you want to end up with a specification which actually meets your needs. And you need to decide for yourselves what the appropriate level of compromise is between what you need and the efficiencies that are achieved by procuring in a collaborative or consortium sort of fashion. Um, the other thing is to think about what the marketplace can actually deliver. Um, and I think, again, this links with that pre-market consultation, that collaborative procurement can be incredibly effective after you've engaged with the marketplace, particularly, for example, so that you know that you're not procuring something so big because of the size of your collaboration or your consortium, that it's actually something that the marketplace cannot deliver. It may be, for example, that consultation with the marketplace indicates that you would be better off procuring in lots so you can still engage with a collaborative procurement exercise, but still break down the contract geographically or otherwise so that it's something that a, a wider variety of potential tenderers can bid for. So these are opportunities, but they do need thinking through in the context of specifically what you as an organisation are trying to achieve. So just to finish off then, I just wanted to sum up the things that we've talked about. Um, I'm a big fan of collaborative engagement with the marketplace. And the first message is to say that the public contracts regulations make it very, very clear that collaborative engagement with the marketplace before you procure is entirely possible. You just need to remember that you need to ensure you create a level playing field for the procurement process itself, thinking about the timescales involved and the sharing of information. You need to think about planning ahead and notifying the market of both the opportunity to engage with you, but then the, the opportunity to tender for a contract itself using prior information notices as that notification to the market and also potentially a call to competition where it's appropriate. And remember that you can only consider excluding a possible tenderer as an absolute last resort 
that your your first call under the procurement process is to make sure that you have a level playing field by sharing that information and allowing for appropriate timescales. So those issues need to be thought about while you're engaging with the marketplace beforehand, but absolutely do not let that stop you um, from going ahead and talking to the marketplace before you procure. And then thinking about those last couple of slides, think about the different routes of procurement that might save time while still being compliant. So in many situations, it is going to be the use of a framework or a, a dynamic purchasing system, which is going to get you the, the swiftest and most efficient procurement process. But think about where your willingness to compromise is and how much time is off the essence, but needs to be balanced out against what you're trying to achieve and whether the framework framework agreement is both compliant and actually does what you want it to do. And then think about how you can collaborate with other registered providers and local authorities on the procurement processes, whether as part of a consortium bid approach for the funding itself or outside of those consortium bids, so that even where the procurement process can't be shortened, perhaps you make it more efficient and effective by collaborating with neighbours and consortium members alike. OK, so I hope that's been helpful. Um, if there are any questions, my contact details are on the last slide, as are Shra's. Um, so do get in touch with any questions um, and anything you might want to discuss as a result of um, hearing this presentation. And as I say, I hope it's been really helpful. Okay, take care.